Evening. Hope everyone's doing doing well this evening. Welcome to another Peaceful Solution Character Education uh, Program Teacher Certification Course. Uh, you can be seated. I'd like to welcome everybody who's here locally, as well as those who are watching us uh, from afar online, Facebook, uh, PeacefulSolution.org uh, website, and um, whether you're joining us for the 50th time or the or the first time. Uh, welcome to the class. We're, we're going to be continuing uh, this evening as we move forward. Uh, we are in, uh, oh, I have that wrong. It's supposed to be responsibility. I uh, don't show that first slide. <laughs> it's supposed to be um, uh, responsibility, not respect. Sorry about that. Um, for chapter six in the responsibility unit here, this is uh, unit number five of the intermediate series. And um, we are just going to, I want to go back here just a little bit. Uh, we're going to pick up where William left off last class, uh, and he was talking about some of the things that we see taking place in regards to crime, because we're seeing what, what occurs uh, in our society, and we've seen this take place uh, many, many years, um, not only here in the United States, but all throughout the world. I mean, these, these effects of, or the effects of immorality, the effects of a lack of education, the effects of negative influences, it crosses all boundaries, right? It's not limited to just the United States. Now, a lot of what you hear and a lot of what you see in many of the articles that are, are presented uh, in the Peaceful Solution, they do tie into the things that are taking place currently within the United States, because we have plenty taking place in the United States that we don't even have to stretch out into the, the international community. But I believe that any one of uh, you know, our students that are watching here, uh, you can easily take a look at you know, your own community, your own nation, uh, your own village, or, or your own country, and, and see, uh, apply current events, news articles, and so forth that, uh, that tie into the lessons uh, being presented in the Peaceful Solution. And that is, you know, something that we teach that's a great idea for you to do to kind of give uh, supplements to your students because they can better relate to things that are taking place <clears throat> in their environment, right, in their, their immediate surroundings. Uh, they can relate to things taking place in the government or problems taking place here. It might be a little bit difficult for them to see and understand something that's taking place in another country. So there's no problem in bringing articles that support, and that's what we do many times because, you know, the articles that are here in the book are, you know, over 20-something years old. So they're still relevant in supporting the information that's presented, but sometimes you have to bring some updated things because, as we've mentioned in previous classes, there's a lot that it has changed technologically in the last 20 years that this book was just barely, barely, you know, scraping the surface on. We've gone from cassette tapes to CDs to MP3s to streaming, right? Or kind of streaming and MP3s is, you know, kind of in that same boat. And so, um, you know, and the internet, that's another big thing that has that become so vastly available uh, to pretty much every corner of the earth right now. There might be a few places that don't, that don't have uh, internet. And then the, the media devices that give people of all ages access to all types of media, whether it's positive or whether it's negative, these are a part of the contributing factors that greatly impact the, the, the thinking and as a result, the character and the behavior everybody within every society okay so this is again why the peaceful solution is needed like we've mentioned in times past where there's people there's problems where there's problems there's a need for the peaceful solution there's a need for character education so don't you know when you hear these things don't think that it's it, it pertains only to one particular country or one particular group of people because it's not these problems that we bring forth in the peaceful solution or that we address in the peaceful solution in the articles and so forth when the rules are broken they're global all right so just kind of keep that in mind as a teacher because of course you're learning and training to be able to teach and how to present this information and sometimes you do have to adjust not the material but adjust the the supplements or the um, extracurricular activities to help to tie into your location so I want to go back here just a little bit because we're going to be picking up um, 
w William left off on page 101 there with their article for the, uh, you know, the, 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 the counselor that was beaten uh, by several girls that she was responsible for, and she was doing her uh, responsibility. And in fact, you know, I went and read up, I don't know if it was in here. Um, let's see here. Because I read up on another article, because I was trying to look and see. Uh, it's not in this article, but there are other articles that, from different news sources that, you know, give the information on this article here from uh, 2000, 2002, I believe. And, um, and this lady, this counselor, you know, she had, she had suffered some things in the past from previous incidences or run-ins with students. But because she cared about her job so much, she cared about helping these young people so much, she went back, right? Even though people were like, hey, just, you know, take time off and just, you know, kind of collect yourself and so forth. No, she insisted on going back because she truly did care about her job. It was more than just a paycheck to her. Um, and then, of course, later on, she was um, brutally attacked in this manner. And I was looking to find uh, a little bit more information to kind of see uh, where these people are today because, um, you know, 2002, so this is, you know, 22 years ago. I think the, the oldest girl was about um, 15 or 16 years old. Um, and I think that they got about a, the sentences range from about three to ten years uh, across the board. The one that perpetrated the uh, incident, um, I think she was the oldest at the time, she received the longest sentence, was, which, which was supposed to be about ten years. So, you know, they'd be out by now. You know, I was kind of wondering if, you, if I could find anything on what they've, what they've done with their life. You know, have they turned things around? Have they made better choices? Or have they continued to be in and out of the... Um, um, penal system. But anyway, um, on page uh, lesson plan six, page C, we'll just briefly go back to um, um, uh, procedure three here. And this is where <coughs> William left off. <clears throat> it says, tell students that it only takes a small percentage of morally irresponsible people to adversely affect the majority. And that's kind of like what William was talking about last class. You know, it just takes a little bit of leaven, right? It takes a little bit of bacteria or rot uh, to spoil all the apples. Or, you know, you kind of see like bananas. You know, one banana gets a little brown spot on it, and it just starts to spread to all the other bananas. And next thing you know, all the bananas have a deep, deep tan. And that's when you get your banana bread. So it's not always a bad thing when it comes to bananas. Um, but that's, all, that's what it takes, and we see that in, in uh, you know, family life or in groups or, you know, places where there's a, a, a small community of people. You know, take, set aside the city or the state or the nation um, or even globally, which we saw a lot of things that, that took place that affected our lives, everyone's lives after events like 9-11 or the... Um, the um, the shoe bomber, right? Um, there was another one too. I can't remember who he was, but you know, people were doing things to try to sneak things on airplanes, and it completely affected everybody in air travel, right? So all it takes is just a little, per, a little small, or a small percentage, or just a few people who who have morally irresponsible behaviors to adversely affect the majority. Have students take turns reading the article found on page 101, which uh, we did last, last class, and allow students to complete under, understanding the main point found on page 102 and discuss their answers as a class. Now, if you remember, William covered this article about the um, counselor beaten, set on fire, and teen girls arrested as a result. Now, you know, I think I read that... Um, uh, one of the articles when the uh, oldest girl was being sentenced, she said, you know, I knew what I was doing was wrong, and I'm sorry for what I did, and I know that you probably won't forgive me, but I do ask for your forgiveness. So, you know, even though she knew what she was doing was wrong, like William said, you know, people have to be educated. People have to be trained. People have to have uh, a continual pattern of teaching 
until those words, those values, those ideas, those principles become firmly established as a valued, a valued teaching in the person's mind. Just because a person's in class doesn't mean that they're truly listening and paying attention to everything that's taking place. And that's why it's important as you as teachers um, to interact with your students. And this is perfectly how the Peaceful Solution is set up to get this feedback uh, and these interactions and these activities with your students to make sure that they are grasping the concepts of the lessons. And it's no problem with going back a little bit if you need to, to reinforce certain you know, points. And you don't have to necessarily call that person out, but you can do it as a class. Right? Because if there's one person who might not get something, there's probably about two or three others who might not get it but might be a little bit too embarrassed to say anything about it. So you're not going to do any injustice to your class by going back and rehearsing some of the information, which we do on a regular basis. But, but, but these girls here, you know, the actions that they took um, for whatever reason, right? who knows what inspired them to take such violent actions <coughs> against the staff member that was there to to help them okay uh, to give them another opportunity you know sometimes these facilities that are set up um, are there as an alternative course to juvenile detention or imprisonment right in some of the states they actually try to do things to work with young people young offenders uh, in order to keep them out of the penal system to some degree because they know that they're just going to learn more <laughs> negative behaviors once they get in there. Um, and so they do try to make some attempts. There are some groups and advocates and states and you know even politicians that do try to make some attempts to make things right. <clears throat> All right, so let's look on page 102. Now, if you remember the article from last class, um, and we're going to look at four of these questions here and understanding the main point. And the first question there that you would ask your students is, how was the victim of the crime affected, right? The, the counselor, the 32-year-old counselor who was beaten, kicked down the stairs, uh, set on fire, had alcohol and chlorine, you know, doused on her face and, and, and in her mouth and everything. How was she affected? Well, of course, you know, some of the answers would vary, and this is where you can get some of the feedback, you know, from your students. Try to, try to kind of get in their heads. Try to get them to have empathy for what this person went through to get an idea of the, the suffering that took place because of the decisions of a few. Because if I'm not mistaken, I believe that facility that they were on housed about 180 to 190 students, right? But this was just, you know, six or eight girls that did this. So the counselor, of course, was beaten, burned, and had chlorine bleach poured on her face. Of course, she was in severe pain, you know, um, to say the least. Uh, I'm sure that she was probably the thought crossed in her mind, you know, is this the way I'm going to go out? You know, because you just never know how how far a person will take their violent behavior. Uh, number two, how do you think this crime might affect the victim's family uh, of the counselor? There it says answers might vary, but should include the victim's family uh, could be sad, um, shocked to hear of how she was viciously abused. Uh, nowadays, people would probably you know, one of the first things they try to do was uh, a formal lawsuit against the uh, against the home for not offering proper protection to counselors and so forth. You know, um, people, everybody wants to sue now for everything. So you know, it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me. But think about think about this: if this woman suffered permanent injuries or brain injuries that would render her disabled in some way, you know, that would also put a little bit of a demand on her family members if she, you know, well, family members, regardless whether she was married or not, um, or, or if she had children, to help take care of her now, right? Because now there's things that she used to be able to do independently before this um, event occurred, 
Now she's not able to. And it doesn't take much. Just a few, you know, hard blows to the head can create some serious brain trauma. And people, we've seen it even before with even boxers. You know, they'll get in the ring and they'll have one hit to the head that doesn't look like anything outside of the ordinary. It's not ordinary to go and beat the snot out of people for, for fun, you know, but it seems like it is in today's society. People actually pay to see it. Uh, you know, people get paid to get beat up. Um, and, I, and, I, and it was pretty sad because I saw one incident. It was um, one of many. But a guy, he got he got knocked out. And uh, it wasn't just him getting knocked out. He actually had a, a severe traumatic brain injury that rendered him almost near to being a vegetable. You know, he, he did have some consciousness about him and was able to kind of interact with eye movements and things like that, but the man was never the same. Fully functioning, healthy individual, right? But because of certain type of risky behaviors, and these do classify in risky behaviors, anything that could bring harm to yourself, and boxing and the MMA and all these things are classified as things that bring harm to yourself. They're not going in there and, and shaking hands and, you know, doing Pilates and things like that. No, they're trying to fight to the death, you know? Uh, no no holds barred, closed cage match, you know, and people, it's like people have an insatiable desire for more and more violence. And we're going to talk a little bit about this because our society has, has grown to this point um, where, where the more the, the gore, you know, the blood, the violence, the kicks, uh, the, the better it is for the audience. It's it's not really anything new because they they did have this going on back in the days of the Roman gladiators and and so forth and they were engaging in these things and they were taking people and, and forcing them to fight under certain circumstances but it was a it was just a gore fest right there was nothing beneficial that came out of it outside of the people that made money off of the bets of people's lives. All right now number three there how do you think? the other counselors at Mount Pleasant might be affected. No answers might vary, but should include other counselors might be afraid while at work. While at work. Um, they might ask that two people be scheduled for the 11 to 7 a.m. shift. And they might even want to change jobs, which of course will put an even greater burden upon the people because what? When you have a certain amount of children or people at a facility, they usually account for there being a certain uh, ratio of caretakers or counselors or teachers or those responsible per so many students, right? Whether it's one to 10 or one to 20 or whatever the case might be. Well, if people start leaving their jobs, how's that going to affect the facility? One, how's that going to affect the children? Two, okay, um, which it'll probably make it subject to even uh, more violent crimes because there won't be anyone there really to regulate that. And then number four there, how were the girls who committed the crime affected? Well, of course, the older girls are now in jail. They're out by now. Hopefully they stayed out and are facing charges for attempted second degree murder. The younger ones were sent to another detention center. Um, and by committing this crime, they have changed the outcome of their futures. And this is something that's hard to get young people to see as teachers, as parents, <coughs> as adults, as counselors. Um, it is quite a challenge to try to, you know, impart a certain amount of knowledge or, or paint a picture in the mind of young people because for thousands of years and generations upon generations, I think probably we've even said it to, to our parents or our teachers, you know, things have changed. You don't understand. Things are not like they were when you were a child. Okay, these are statements that is said in every single generation. Now, you guys are weird. You guys are old fashioned, <laughs> you know? But the fact is, the things that that influence a young person to make certain decisions, right? Or to do certain things in order to be accepted. Uh, it's all the same. You know, it all ties into our character. 
Now, there might be some other devices uh, that help to make things a lot more prevalent or abundant or available, but what a person chooses or not or chooses not to do is based on what they've been taught and their character. And it goes back to those six factors that we covered at chapter one in the character unit. You know, the genetics and influences and choices and environments and so forth, right? And those things, they're all the same. So it doesn't matter. A thousand years down the road, children will probably be saying it's the same thing. You know, it's not the same thing. Things are different. But no, your character. That's the foundation of any choice that you make. Who told you? Did you get permission to just go fly over to the moon and have ice cream with your friends after curfew? No, you didn't right? <laughs> so that's why you got pulled over because you guys were doing, you know, light speed in a, in a sub light speed zone. Okay. Bad choices. All right. Um, but when you think about today and what's taking place with society, with a lot of young people today, we're seeing an increase in, in violent crimes amongst young people. And it's sad because, you know, I remember when I was in high school, um, in junior high, you did occasionally see fights take place, uh, but it was not necessarily an everyday thing. Uh, you know, it was, I'll see you in the parking lot after school or whatever the case might be. But it was kind of a rare occurrence. Now, I understand that there are some schools that there were fights that took place every day, right? When I had an opportunity to select the school that uh, I could go to for high school, I didn't want to go to the schools where there were fights every day, you know, because I didn't want to be involved in that environment. I didn't like violence. I didn't like fighting. I didn't want to be around it. Sometimes people get hurt. Bystanders get hurt, right? Um, and so I chose a different school. But it's increasing not only in the schools, but these things are taking place all throughout society, all in the neighborhood. Now, I've got a video here that's going to talk a little bit. It was a news report about um, how... The crime is increasing uh, amongst young people, violent crimes, not just, you know, little petty crimes and so forth, but actual violent crimes are increasing with a lot of our youth taking place here in the United States. And again, this is just like one little uh, article of one particular area in the United States. This is a global thing. OK, uh, crime is taking place and violent crime has increased amongst many cultures, many nations, many people, many youth. Why? Because the value of morality is not being diligently and consistently taught throughout the world. Now, it's not to say that nobody's doing it, okay? Not to say that there's no parents or no cultures or no countries that don't value it. That's not true. But the fact is, it needs to be something that's consistently taught both in the home and outside of the home. So let's take a look at that uh, first video there, please. The amount of crime we report on is never easy, but recently violent incidents involving teenagers has been unsettling. Thank you for joining us at 11. I'm Brian Loftus. And I'm Denise Valdez. 8 News Now reporter Madison Kimbrough spoke to parents and doctors who share what they've seen and what they believe is the root cause. She joins us now live from Metro headquarters with more. Many believe that the evolution of social media may be a factor in this violence among surge among teens and doctors that we spoke to say that these opportunities that these teens take, they see it as a moment to go viral, no matter how much damage it may cause. Take a listen. You got to just have eyes on your kids and really talk to them and be there and know what's going on. Parents not holding back when it comes to their kids. Victor Claiborne has a three-year-old son, and while he's not a father to a teen yet, he sees what goes on with teenagers today. Levi Price, also a father to two young boys, and acknowledges how the violence among our youth seems to be amplified now by social media use. You see the fights on in school, like, instead of people breaking up the fight, they're all filming it and just encouraging it and trying to post it on social media. Within the last couple months, there have been several shootings and attacks involving teenagers across the valley. From a party bus attack where a 17-year-old boy allegedly raped a teen girl to a teen boy shot in his neighborhood while outside playing. Then there was an 18-year-old who shot a campus security monitor at Von Tobel Middle School earlier this month. Dr. Sid Karana, psychiatrist at Nevada Mental Health, sharing what he has seen at his practice in regards to teen youth. We have seen an uptick in all types of violence, and it just demonstrates a, a very clear skill deficit. 
that there is an interpersonal problem. Family therapist Donna Wilburn says since COVID, the demand for help has spiked. Child to child violence, the fights, the group fights, things in schools, things outside of schools. We are getting so many teens into counseling because of violence that many agencies have a waiting list. And while we all wish there was a simple fix to stop these vicious acts, paying attention and being involved is the first step. I have too many parents going, what are they stressed about? They don't have anything to be stressed about. That's not validating, okay? Your child is stressing and you need to understand and empathize from their point of view, not impose your point of view. With landscaping companies, they say, oh. And with summer break underway, doctors hope they see a decline in stress for most teens, which in turn could curb some of the violence that we've been seeing. Reporting live at Metro headquarters, Madison Kimbrough, 8 News Now. All right. So this is this is a real thing that many of the youth are dealing with. And even as the, the one psych- <clears throat> psychologist said, you know, in dealing with the mental health of a lot of people, you know, they're suffering. They're going through a lot of different type of stressors in their lives. And these people... These young people, they're ill-equipped to be able to deal with it. So what are they doing? They're lashing out. They're acting out based on how they've been trained, okay, Um, or the lack thereof. So there has to be in those agencies that are, um, that are, uh, have waiting lists, you know, contact the Peaceful Solution. We can kind of help you, you know, shave away a little bit of that because we do have uh, agencies right now that are, uh, using the peaceful solution, the information that is presented in the peaceful solution to help a lot of both young men and, and women and older men and older women to make better choices. Um, and, and because that's just what it comes down to. People just have to have the opportunity to be taught and to understand that they do have value. And as we mentioned and we covered a little bit, uh, well, quite a bit in um, chapter two of the uh, character unit when we talked about the effects of character within the family, a lot of these things did stem uh, you know, from the home, and it kind of grows from there. Sometimes there's abuse, sometimes there's neglect, and neglect does not always mean, you know, physically neglecting the person, but neglecting them in education, not not training them, not pointing them in the right direction, okay? Uh, and it's not necessarily always, we're not blaming the fault of the parents, putting them at fault, because they might not have been trained as well, right? So, and it's not a matter of pointing fingers. It's just a matter of acknowledging that there's a problem. Now, what do we need to do to fix the problem? As one of the first doctors said, he said, uh, you know, they're having interpersonal problems, interpersonal uh, issues. Uh, that definition of that word interpersonal, uh, I think it's my number two slide there. It's uh, being or relating to or including relations between persons. Now, we talk a little bit about that all throughout the Peaceful Solution and our relationship with other people. Well, how do we relate to other people? With our words, with our actions, with our attitudes, right? Our behavior and so forth. Well, what is the basis of that? Some personality, but most of it's character. Okay, how we're acted towards and how we respond, how we act towards others and how they respond and so forth. So we've got to give people the foundation to make better choices, even with their interpersonal skills and how they relate to one another, seeing and having value in themselves so that they, you know, I was kind of joking with somebody uh, earlier in the week and saying, you know, know, the old saying, treat others as as you treat yourself. Uh, I don't want some people treating me like they treat themselves. (laughs) Some people, they don't treat themselves very well. They abuse themselves. They harm themselves. They... You know, they abuse drugs and alcohol and other things, you know, and I really don't want them treating me like that, you know. Uh, but uh, you have to teach them because why would they do that? Why would a person do those things? Why would they bring harm to themselves? Again, they don't see the value in themselves, okay? And again, we reiterate it over and over and over because that's how the information, that's how the lessons, that's how the principles get into the mind and the heart and starts to change the person. And of course, These behaviors and these lessons, they have to be role modeled, right, by the teacher, by the parent. And and that sometimes is the challenge because you as a teacher, you're going to be dealing with these situations where you're you're trying to reprogram your students, put a different program into their mind of morality, 
but then they go home or they're in a certain environment and that programming can start to overwhelm the other programming. So this is why it's very beneficial to get the parents involved, to get the guardians involved, right? And the more people we have involved with this, like they say, it takes a village to raise a child, right? Uh, because the child's not always with the parents. I know when I grew up, I was talking to some, some of the, the teachers the other day, you know, I remember making some, I don't know, I guess I could say there were bad choices, you know, when I was younger. And it was about two or three people that knew about it. Uh, and I was, I was quickly reminded, <laughs> you know, once I got home, you know, that these things don't fly under the radar, you know. And it, if it hadn't been for the other members of the community, you know, stepping in, why? Not because they were trying to get me in trouble, but because they cared about me. Right, they cared about my behavior. They didn't want to see me get get in trouble. Right. In fact, they were there to help get me out of trouble. And they did things and said certain things that, you know, led to me making better choices later on in life. Now at the very bottom of the page there it says, Here is something to think about. If one crime could have so many negative consequences, and this is just one crime of these young ladies here who beat up a thirty two year old counselor. How do you think 15 million crimes annually would affect society? 15 million crimes. And, you know, as of 2023, <coughs> globally, <coughs> there are approximately 2.4, it was 2.4 to 2.9, 2.4 uh, children under 18. Okay, 2.4 children under 18, and, and many of them are left to their own devices, left to try to figure out life for themselves. You know, children do need a support system. You know, we can't just tell them to go out and figure it out on their own. It doesn't work that way. That's why they're born to parents. That's why they're surrounded and, t and trained and taught by adults in their environment when they go to school because we're the ones that are responsible for guiding and teaching them how to one day become responsible moral adults. Okay, and, and again, sometimes you gotta go back and teach the teacher, you know, because, you know, it's easier. We saw some of the examples in uh, chapter two of the character unit, you know, sometimes parents, they're, they're not responsible. You know, the, 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 we saw the example of the parents who had the child that was screaming and hungry and crying, and all they wanted to do was eat and drink and and party and go hang out with their friends. And this still takes place. You can still find articles in the news of, of that today. I just saw a news article the other day where a, a mother was recently arrested because she left her four-year-old at home by themselves. I think there was two children um, at home by themselves, not so she can go down the street to get something at the convenience store or go down the road over here to meet her friend at the bar so she could go on a cruise. This woman went on a cruise and left her four, and I think it was a two-year-old child at home. And you know one of the things she said when she was arrested? Well, I left them a cell phone so they could get a hold of me if they needed to. Now, you would think, what in the world is that woman? You know, she's got to be out of her mind. Well, she taught, right? Was she taught? Now, I don't know how old the woman was. I think she was in her early 20s or something like that. But a person who is educated and who understands the value of life and the vulnerability of a child, there's no way, no way in their right mind, right, that they would subject the child to that type of environment. So it's obvious that there are a few things that were missing in her life that caused her to make those decisions. Again, she's a symptom of a greater problem. All right, um, let's see here. Do I want to read this article? <coughs> I have a little article here um, from the CDC. Um, let me see here. Yeah, this, this, this pertains to, a, to the young people here because we're going to get ready to get into on page 103, crimes in the millions, but um, I think it's slide number three there. Now, this is uh, what we see with youth violence because we're talking about these young girls who did this here, not just them, but we see it across the board there. Um, now, this is according to the Centers for Disease Control. The Centers for Disease Control, right, they, they have taken these statistics. So they're, you know, there's something that they're seeing 
uh, in the minds and bodies of the people for them to be, now they're not the only place that reports this, but it's interesting that the Centers for Disease Control are giving these estimates. And so here is a scope of the problem with youth violence. It says, worldwide, an estimated 176,000 homicides occur among young people between ages 15 and 29 years of age, or um, yeah, years of age each year, making it the third leading cause of death for people in this age group. Third leading cause, not cancers, not diseases, right? Homicides, which we've brought out many times in, in many of our presentations. Um, youth homicide rates vary dramatically between and within countries. Between 2000 and 2019, rates of youth homicide decreased in most countries, although the decrease has been greater in high-income countries than in low-income and middle-income countries. The majority of youth homicide victims are males, and most perpetrators are males, too. For every young person killed by violence, more sustain injuries that require hospital treatment. Firearm attacks end more often in fatal injuries than assaults that involve fists, feet, knives, and blunt objects. But they do occur because sometimes it can, all it takes is one you know, misplaced kick or punch or blunt object to a particular part in the body, and it can cause the person to... Um, suffer as a result of being hit in that part of the body with that object or even falling to the ground. We've seen instances uh, uh, when people were going through and there was some type of, um, I don't know if it was a challenge or just what it was, but it was particularly in, in New York City where we saw some of the articles, people were just walking down the street and just randomly punching people, you know, just punching them. You know, and one person, you know, got knocked out from the punch and hit their head on the curb. You know, and they ended up dying as a result of a brain hemorrhage. You know, these things are not, you know, people are literally playing with other people's lives. You know, this is not a game. And instantly, that person and everyone who depended on that person, including the perpetrator who did it, their life changed. You can't go and undo that. Any type of activity, any type of behavior, any choice, you can't go and undo it. The time to undo it is before you, you engage in it to begin with. And then uh, here's a few more articles here, a few more points here from the CDC. It says sexual violence <clears throat> also affects a significant portion of youth. For example, one in eight young people report sexual abuse. That's just the amount of people that actually report it, right? As we covered previous books, previous lessons, a lot of these cases go unreported. Physical fighting and bullying are also common among young people. A study of 40 developing countries showed that an average of 42% of boys and 37% of girls, and this was something that you, um, you, you, you didn't hear a lot of. They were exposed to bullying, but, but um, they, you know, they've always been exposed to bullying. But I was thinking about the amount, the increased amount of girls that are engaging in fights, right? You're seeing a lot more of this take place, and it was kind of a, you know, a thing that, not saying girls never fought, right? You know, but, but it's increasing in this time period now and like the guy said you know instead of helping people people are putting it on social media they're standing there with their cameras right incidents of road rage and things like that things that take place in the school things that take place you know on the um, you know and in, in, in the community at the malls and so forth everybody wants to become famous by putting that particular video on the web, on the internet and then lastly there it says youth homicide and non-fatal violence not only contribute greatly to the global burden of premature death, injury, and disability, but also have a serious, often lifelong impact on a person's psychological and social functioning. This can affect victims' families, <clears throat> friends, and community. Youth violence increases the cost of health, welfare, and criminal justice services, reduces productivity, decreases the value of property, you know, because you see in a lot of these places where it seems like what they say, the children run the streets, you know, these gangs and so forth, and the young people who kind of run around unsupervised, you know, people don't want to go out. You know, they're going and, and tagging buildings and structures through vandalism and so forth. People just don't feel safe. Uh, it reduces property value. Uh, you know, and what occurs when the property value is reduced? Well, it makes it even cheaper and people just, you know, they, whoever I can get in there, 
I'll put whoever in there, right? And then it becomes a tit for tat because people have, they feel they have to be armed. And they have, you know, in a lot of the, the major cities, I don't see it a lot around Abilene. I think it is to some degree, but where I grew up in Cleveland, you know, it was a big thing for houses, especially lower level houses, to have the fancy cast iron bars on the doors and the, uh, and the windows, you know, because that first level floor was the most vulnerable to people breaking in. You know, um, we ha we had them on our door, and then I mean, they made them, you know, ornate, and they looked real pretty and everything. But they were a security door, is essentially what they were. They were a security door because people they will come and they will bust down your door and come in your house, right? They didn't care if you were home or not, and so people had to go through all these extra expenses. And companies now, somebody might say, well, it was great for the economy because you know there were jobs provided and you know companies were started. But look. People shouldn't have to worry about their safety, you know? You know, if you leave your car, you know, you get a phone call when you get home and you leave your keys and your ignition and your, you know, and your wallet in your vehicle, you should be able to come downstairs or come out of your house the next morning and your keys and your car and everything should still be in the same place, right? Uh, you can't do that anymore. You know, back in the 90s, when they had face plates, removable face plates, you'd see guys walking all throughout the mall and the stores, they'd be having the face plate of their radio in their hand. Why? Because everybody was stealing radios then, right? So somebody came up with an idea. Well, let's take a removable face, a face plate. You know, well, they didn't care because somebody else can get a face plate. People were stealing face plates. You know, it's like people always will try to find a way <coughs> to circumvent security. So more security doesn't prevent the problem like we're going to see here more prisons don't reduce crime harsher sentences you'll see that coming from some of the uh the the politicians and advocates and community leaders you know we need harsher sentences for people who commit these crimes you know stick them in jail for longer and so forth well you know they're not affecting the community outside you know and once they get caught yeah they might be sentenced that's if they get caught but there's 10 other people that are ready to do the very same thing that they did. You know, those things don't fix the problem. Education is, the reason they're doing what they're doing is because they were educated. But they were educated in immorality. And that became a major part of their value system. Instead of valuing life and property and respect for themselves, others in the environment, they value taking advantage, disrespecting others, you know making themselves seem like the, the, what they say, the BMOC, the big man on campus, right? The king of the hill or whatever. No, this guy, he's, he's robbed the most throughout the neighborhood. He's stolen 15 cars and never got caught once, right? Or he's the biggest drug dealer out here. Don't you know, stay out of his territory, whatever the case might be. These are the, the stats that, that people look up to instead of, uh, of morality. Morality in people's minds is not really not cool anymore. Um, all right, so let's look at page 103 there. We're going to make it cool, though. <laughs> We're going to make it popular once again. Um, let's turn back here before we go there to Lesson Plan 6, page D. We're going to look at Procedure 4 because we're moving into Procedure 4 with page 103. It says, have students turn to page 103 in their handbooks to the section Crimes in the Millions. Analyze the chart. Discuss the answer, the critical thinking, questions found on page 104 as a class. As, as the uh, class determines the correct answers, allow time for students to write the answers in the spaces provided in their handbooks. Emphasize that a lack of, morale, a lack of moral responsibility coupled with the lack of self-control are the causes of the crimes that negatively affect society. So all these things that we're teaching in the Peaceful Solution, character traits, characteristics that we're teaching to develop, a lack of these things, right, are a cause of the crimes that negatively affect society. And that's another thing that, you know, we try to relay over to our students, you know, the young men and young women that come to us that understand whether you see it now or whether you see it later, to every cause, there's an effect. To every decision that you make, there's going to be an effect to that decision. Now, we're not just saying it's negative. It could be positive or negative, right? You, you put in the effort now, it's like a farmer. If he goes out in the springtime and puts so much seed down in the ground, 
he's going to get a crop at the end of that growing season. Now, if he goes and he plants a whole bunch of uh, uh, prickly prickly burr things, what do they call those sticky burr things, <laughs> you know, at the end of the season, now, unless he's a sticky burr farmer, which might be great, I don't know who would want to do such an atrocious thing, atrocious thing, <laughs> you know, um, he's going to get sticky burrs. If he doesn't do nothing, he's just going to get what comes up. And most of the times, it's probably going to be weeds. Well, it's the same thing with planting certain things in the minds of our students and getting them to take and plant certain thoughts and teachings into their mind. You know, the, the subconscious mind, like we've covered before, it's just, a, it's just like a fertile piece of soil. It doesn't care if you put a weed plant in there, a weed seed in there, or if you put, you know, a, a healthy seed, a beautiful flower in there, or a tree in there. It's going to take and it's going to feed that seed until it produces a particular fruit or whatever plant it is, you know? Well, it's the same thing with negativity. Even though a person might not understand what's being put in their mind, it's going to produce something. So our goal is to kind of intercept that with our teachings, with the Peaceful Solutions teachings, and help them see you can change the way you think, feel, and act right now if you will take these lessons, value them, and put them to work in your life. <clears throat> So here it says, I emphasize that a lack of moral responsibility coupled with the lack of self-control are the causes of the crimes that negatively affect society. Briefly go over the information on pages 105 through 107, explaining society's answer to crimes is the prison system. And we'll, we'll get into that. Um, well, we might get into a little bit this class, but probably next class. <clears throat> tell, students that, uh, tell students the different types of prisons, which we'll cover uh, lastly there. So let's look back over here to page 103 and we'll see at the very top there it says crimes in the millions. Um, crimes have become so commonplace in our society that people have become desensitized to it and its effects. Right? And we talked about that in uh, chapter uh, 1 in regards to influences and in violent movies. Not, not chapter 1 but unit 1. Right? And how when people watch something over and over and over again, you know, movies with violence in them, uh, you know, movie with horror and gore and things like that or crime, you know, at first they might, you know, oh, you know, you hear the bones crunching and, the, you know, there's guys that actually get paid a lot of money to make all those sound effects, you know, on these movies. But, you know, you'll hear the bones crunching and you'll see things, you know, oozing and things like that damage take place. And at first you're like, oh, man, I can't. Oh, I can't take it anymore because, you, you know, you have sympathy pains, you know. And then after a while, it's like, yeah, yeah, get him. All right, yeah. Woo, did you see that way he did that, man? Oh, I'm going to be like, whoa, 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 whoa. Huh? you know. And then you're leaving the movie theater practicing moves on your buddy, you know. And it's all fun and games until somebody gets hurt, right. But people have become desensitized to the effects. And this is, I would say, a, you know, a commonplace throughout all society. And you... They're crying. They're people that will actually drive by an accident. You know, they'll see they've done social experiments to see how people respond to, you know, someone trying to talk to a child, you know, and try to get them to, you know, go with them somewhere or some guy being abusive to a, to a woman or is trying to abuse a lady in certain places or, you know, whatever the case might be. And most people are just like, none of my business, none of my business. You know, it's like people don't care anymore. And that's not saying that you have to necessarily put yourself in danger or in harm's way, but a simple pick up the phone and call the police or something like that. Make somebody who can do something aware of the situation. Now, I understand there's situations where people might be dealing with a weapon or something. You don't want to just go, you know, you're not Superman and jump in front of that, you know, and you end up losing your life too. But there are things that people can do, you know, and the, the, the higher the degree of morality in this in society you know the the lower these crimes these these um, activities these immoral activities will will see and we're, we'll get there it's gonna take a little while it's like a chicken pecking away at like Mount Everest or something so it says in other words people do not always react with shock outrage and disgust when they hear about a crime they just accept it as a normal way of life. And I've seen plenty of news articles that people are just like, yeah, you know, that's just how it is around here. You know, that's an everyday thing around here. And if somebody got shot or somebody broke into a house or somebody ran into a, um, you know, 
not we've had uh, several occasions over the last few years where people literally took their vehicles and drove through crowds. You know, people who were they weren't protesting or anything. It was just like an outside event, and they took their vehicle and they drove through the crowd. You know, now it kind of makes you wonder what would what's going on in a person's mind to cause them to have such little value for life that um, that they would do that. But it has. It's become so commonplace in today's society. Now, the following is a chart of the number of arrests in the United States during the year 1997. And, uh, and so we have crimes here. And then the, at, to the right, the number of arrests, it was uh, drug, drug abuse violations. We saw approximately uh, 1, 1.5 million uh, people arrested. <coughs> now, keep in mind, well, I'll wait because I'm jumping ahead of myself there. Um, driving under the influence, a little over 1.4 million. Larceny and theft, uh, 1.4. Assault, 1.3. Disorderly conduct, uh, 811,000. Uh, drunkenness, 636,000. Fraud, 414,000. Weapons, that is carrying, possessing, etc. Could be brandishing a firearm or something like that. People in the road rage. You know, somebody cuts them off and they just, you know, they'll hold up a weapon or something like that. Uh, 218,000 runaways, uh, 196,000, um, probably more so running away, running people who have taken in runaways. They don't typically arrest runaways, but, you know, people who have taken away, taken runaways. Um, and a lot of times they'll they'll take these uh, young people across state lines and then it becomes an international or a federal crime. Um, curfew and loitering law violations, over 182,000. Motor vehicle theft, 167,000. I think that number's probably increased with Kias. Um, sex offenses, over 101,000. Arson, burning things down uh, or setting things on fire, over 20,000. And, of course, murder and manslaughter, um, 18,000, a little over 18,000. It says at the bottom there, data for 1997, uh, arrest totals are based on reporting agencies and estimates for estimates for under or unreported areas. Because of rounding, figures might not add up to the totals. And that was from the FBI uni uniform or UCR or uniform crime report. And then at the very bottom there, so I was going to jump in front of myself, but um, keep in mind that many criminals escape arrest and many more crimes go unreported and unsolved each year. Hence, the figures reported in this chart of arrest in the United States represent a fraction of the actual crimes that occur that occurred that year, in the year 1997. In other words, there's a lot more. They, they estimate that the numbers could be anywhere from, from three to five times more of the actual crimes. Why? Because you have a lot of things, they just go unreported. And some people have the mindset that, well, you know, why call the police anyway? They're not going to do anything about it. You know, why, why go here or why mention this or why do that? Sometimes people aren't capable of reporting certain crimes. Sometimes people are threatened with their life not to report certain crimes, you know, uh, especially children or the elderly or people that are abused, people that are handicapped. Many people every year are, are, who are handicapped who can't speak or defend themselves, they're victims of crimes, but you'll never hear from them because they can't tell anybody about it, right? Usually the only time that that pops up is if someone sees signs of physical abuse or sadly, in a few cases, um, someone becomes pregnant which has occurred in hospitals and care facilities as well. All right, so let's look over to page 104. We're going to do some critical thinking. Well, we're going to get a little bit into some critical thinking. Use the information from the charts to answer the following questions. How many types of arrests could be due to a lack of self-control or discipline? Now, you might get some of your students thinking, you know, hmm, let's see here. Let's see, well, definitely violent crime, auto theft, yeah, larceny, you know. But the answer really should be coming from them, all of them, right? Remember what we covered. Go back here to, uh oh, I went a little bit too far. Um, what was I just reading? Uh... Huh. 
Where did I just read that at? <laughs> well, where did I just read that at about the um, the cause of? Uh, I'm thinking. I'm thinking about something else here. Do you not always hear Christian? I know. I just read it somewhere. What is that? The the cause of uh, you know the the. <laughs> Is the cause of um, a lack of self-control, and in, oh, I read it in the uh, procedures. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just had a uh, little thing there. Um, there, procedure number four. I know I read it somewhere. In procedure number four, we just got finished reading that uh, emphasized that that a lack of moral responsibility. So a lack of moral responsibility coupled with the lack of self-control are the causes of the crimes that negatively affect society. So we just got finished asking, asking the question here, how many of the arrests could be due to a lack of self-control or discipline? Well, why, why are they being arrested? They're being arrested for what? A crime, right? They're being arrested for a crime. Well, why did they commit the crime? Because of a lack of more responsibility responsibility coupled with a lack of self-control so yes the answer for your students would be all of them number two how many of these crimes are uh, are a form of theft and then of course they've got larceny fraud motor vehicle thefts are crimes that are forms of theft and you know when you look at it on a broader sense you know even something like um you know, sex offenses and fraud and arson, even murder. You know, those are forms of, step, of theft. You're stealing something from somebody, whether it's their life, you know, their dignity, their safety, right? Theft doesn't always have to be a tangible object that you can hold, you know, hold in your hands. Even today in, in the corporate world, they have intellectual property, you know, things that are, you know, programs and so forth, names and things of that nature. And so number three there, list four crimes that are a form of risk-taking behavior. Now, this is just to get the students to list four crimes from the list there. Of course, drug abuse violation, assault, drunkenness, and sex offenses are all forms of risky behavior. But in all honesty, they could pick any crime off that list, and they will all cl be classified as forms of risky behavior. Okay. Um, number four, why do you think breaking curfew and loitering are against the law now answers um, uh, might vary but should include breaking curfew and loitering are often a precursor for other types of criminal activities now you know curfew is set in a lot of places for a reason you know if people under a certain age uh, they're not supposed to be out in the community out out on the streets and so forth because like uh, one person once told me one time uh, I was passing through a passing through a little North Texas town. I wasn't I wasn't speeding or anything, but I did get pulled over by the officer because it's about one or two o'clock in the morning, and, uh, and he's like, hey, "What are you doing? I'm just just passing through, heading home from, you know, Wichita Falls, heading back to Clyde." Okay, well, you know, there's no great things that take place at two o'clock in the morning, you know. And I'm thinking, well, I understand, but I'm not involved in that, you know. And of course, he let me go. I was gonna say, well, "What are you doing out here?" You know. <laughs> Put your hands against the wall. <laughs> but, um, but it's true. I mean, you know, uh, unless a person's going to work or guarding a facility or something like that, the nighttime is a time when you should be sleeping, right? Your circadian rhythm is, is, is a rhythm of your natural rhythm of the body that when it gets dark, it's about time to get ready for bed, right? Get in your house. Or like they said at the bars, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. You know, it's the same in the cities. You don't, you don't have to go to your house, but you can't be out in the streets, right? And, and they don't want that because when groups of people who are up to no great get together and start loitering, and especially the greater the numbers, the more tendency there is for foolishness to take place, all right? Normally, you don't see a person running through the streets. You, you've, you've, I would suspect that you've never seen a one-man riot going through the streets, you know? Normally, it's a group of people. And they say there's strength in numbers, and that's what they do. They see one person break the, break the glass, and everybody breaks the glass. And then one person climbs in and grabs a TV or shoes or, 
you know, things off. Everybody's jumping in. No one's doing it just by themselves. So these numbers, they kind of empower people to engage in negative behaviors. They can empower people to engage in positive behaviors if we can get enough people, right? But this is the mindset of people, the, the, the herd mentality, as they call it. So answers would include uh, breaking curfew and loitering are often the precursors for other types of criminal activities and risky behaviors such as selling drugs, drunkenness, and, of course, prostitution, which has been a problem for many, many years. And it's even greater in some areas than it is in others. But nonetheless, it does take place. And this is when these things take place, not just in the evenings, but it's, it's become a little more prevalent in the evenings because people use the cover of night to hide their misdeeds or Mr. Deeds. All right. So um, our next class, we're going to have a, a, an event this coming um, Wednesday. So our next class is actually going to be the 12th uh, of May. We'll be picking up a week from today, the following Sunday at 5.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. Um, I'll be joining you again. We do thank you all for being here. We look forward to uh, seeing you at the next class. Everyone have a wonderful evening.